So we are in the season of Advent, which um, contrary to uh, what Macy's and others would have us believe is not the celebration of Christmas. It's, it's uh, supposed to be the time of um, expectation and hope uh, leading up to the celebration of Christmas. Um, and hope is, um, is, is really the theme of Advent, and it's also the theme of First Thessalonians. Um, so I think it's beautiful how it fits together. Uh, in fact, if you were to pick three words that describe First Thessalonians, it would be uh, hope, holiness, and love. Um, and, but the overarching theme is hope. Um, and when we put that in the context of Advent, we're not just talking about um, hope that comes into the world because God became human, Emmanuel with us, and born, you know, to a virgin, and um, um, wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. Um, that's the beginning of hope. Uh, but that hope continues on uh, through, of course, the, the, the cross when everything changes, when evil is defeated, and then the outworking of that defeat of evil, which is going on now and which will culminate uh, when Jesus comes again. And the second coming of Jesus um, is the blessed hope of the church. So uh, traditionally, when Advent is celebrated, um, if you follow along with the liturgical readings and such, uh, you, you'll see that uh, it usually begins with some readings about the second coming. And, and that confuses some people. They're like, wait a minute, I thought this was about, you know, Bethlehem and shepherds and that stuff. Um, and, and it is about that, but it's also about the ultimate hope when God comes to make all things new. Uh, and that's what First Thessalonians is all about. Um, by way of uh, background, First Thessalonians is, uh, I think, without question, the earliest of Paul's writings. In fact, um, it it is almost certainly the earliest Christian writing that we have. Um, ancient writings were always ordered by length, not by date or by topic. Um, so you'll notice that if you look at Paul's epistles in your New Testament, um, they, they don't go in chronological order. Um, they go in order by longest first uh, down to the shortest. Um, so um, it, that's why they're arranged the way they are. That's just, you know, the way the, uh, the editors put it together. Um, this book was written, you know, scholars debate about when it was written, but it was most likely written in the early 40s. So stop and think about that for a moment. Uh, Paul wrote this letter, you know, most likely he wrote this letter uh, about a decade or so the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. That's, that's really not very long, you know. Um, and uh, he's writing this letter some three decades before the destruction of Jerusalem. So all of those things that Jesus predicted about Jerusalem being destroyed, remember on the, in the, what we call the Olivet Discourse there in, in Matthew chapter 24 and uh, Luke 13 and uh, Mark 21, uh, uh, Jesus there, uh, Matthew 24 and 25, um, in, in those passages, Jesus is predicting uh, the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, which of course the Romans did in 70 AD. Um, and Jesus is, is describing those things about 40 years before they happen. Um, so Paul's writing this about 30 years, or roughly before those things happen. And he knows of those prophecies that Jesus made. He knows, therefore, what's coming. And, and he's going to talk about that. And we'll see that as we go along. Um, so uh, as I said, this is probably the earliest Christian writing in existence. This and the next one, Second Thessalonians. These were the first things uh, written before the Gospels, uh, written before uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, John, written before Romans, written before the book of Acts. Um, 
None of that was in existence when Paul wrote this, this letter and the one that follows it. The background of this letter uh, you can read about in Acts chapter 17. Um, Paul and Silas uh, were traveling as a missionary team. Uh, they had been preaching in Thessalonica for about a month, and there was a tremendous outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. There were many people who pledged their allegiance to King Jesus, uh, Jews and Gentiles both. Um, there was this, uh, we would probably call it a revival, you know, that was going on. Lots of people uh, coming to Christ. Um, and uh, because of that, that stirred up trouble. Uh, Paul and Silas and the other followers of Jesus were accused of treason because they were proclaiming a new king, uh, a king who, who isn't Caesar. Uh, they were saying a new king has come and a new kingdom has come and the new king's name is Jesus uh, and he is Prince of Peace. That's a title that was reserved for uh, Caesar. Uh, he is Lord of Lords. That's another title that was reserved for Caesar. Um, so trouble is stirring. And as we read in chapter uh, 17 of the book of Acts, because of that, Paul and Silas had to flee uh, from, uh, from um, Thessalonica, which greatly upset them. They didn't want to leave. They loved these people, um, but they were really forced to. Now, as far as the design of First Thessalonians, uh, it has two movements. Uh, the first two chapters are a celebration, or the first three chapters, rather, are a celebration of the faithfulness of the Christians in the city of Thessalonia. Um, Thessalonia, of course, uh, was in uh, the area which would, which would be modern day Greece. So we're, you know, we're on that peninsula. Um, the last two chapters are a challenge to continue growing in Christ. So uh, two uh, beautiful movements, a celebration of the Christian's faithfulness and encouragement to keep on growing in the Lord. And it, it's beautifully designed because those two movements are linked together by three prayers. Uh, the first one is introduced with a prayer of thanksgiving, and then the uh, linking the first movement and the second movement is a prayer for endurance, and then uh, it ends with a prayer of hope. So it's completely bracketed by prayer. Uh, you have two major sections, um, the first one introduced by prayer, then the, the two of them linked together by prayer, and then the whole thing ending in prayer. Um, it's really a, a, a beautiful, beautiful design. So chapters one through three, as I said, are a celebration of their faithfulness. And it opens, of course, it opens with the normal kind of greeting. It's a letter. so you know, uh, Paul introduces himself as he, um, you know, typically says who it's from um, and who he's writing to. And then he prays, um, beginning in verse two. Uh, we always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers constantly, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and the steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So introducing this, these first few chapters, which, have to, which are all about celebrating their faithfulness. And he begins by saying, I, I'm continuously giving thanks for you. I remember you in my prayers regularly, um, thanking God for your work of faith and for your labor of love, and for your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that uh, Paul is focusing in on the outworking of their faith, and he's looking at these people, and he's saying, yeah, you guys are amazing. You're doing, you're doing, a, you're doing a great job. You're, you're full of love. You're full of faith. You're, you're uh, laboring in love, and you're steadfast in your hope even though you're living in a tough situation. 
So then he goes on from there and he talks about uh, their conversion. Remember Paul and Silas were there for a while. And there was, as I said, a great outpouring of God's spirit and lots of people, both Jewish and non-Jewish, uh, coming to Christ, uh, confessing Jesus as Lord, um, making Jesus king and Lord of their lives. Um, and, and so that's celebrated. Uh, all these people had turned away from polytheism. Uh, and, and remember that polytheism uh, permeated every part of the society. And they turned away from that and they turned towards, they didn't just reject, they also accepted. They rejected the, the, the incorrect and they accepted the truth. So they turned away from polytheism and they turned towards uh, Jesus making him king of their lives. And as a result, uh, they were filled, the, the Thessalonians were filled with joy. They were filled with love. Um, there was a real tight, I, I'm used the Greek word koinonia, which we usually translate fellowship, but um, sometimes the word fellowship in, in English, you know, gets a little bit watered down and yeah, you know, we might refer to just kind of casual conversation as a time of fellowship. But the word uh, koinonia means fellowship in the sense of doing life together, of really connecting and caring for one another. Um, so uh, as a result of turning away from the false gods and turning towards the true and the living God, uh, and these folks in Thessalonia were full of joy. They were full of love. They were uh, living in this tight community of koinonia, and they, and they had purpose in their lives. Uh, they weren't just existing. Um, they weren't just, um, you know, going through the motions. They had, they had purpose that, that produces the joy in their lives. But also, uh, also as a result of turning away from the false gods and to the living God, they were facing rejection. They were facing mockery. They were facing persecution. Uh, as I said, they, they were accused of treason, um, just like Paul and Silas were when they were there. They're being accused of treason because, um, you know, people are saying, well, hey, Caesar is Lord, and they're responding, no, he isn't. Um, you know, I'm sure they were responding nicely. They, they weren't yelling at, it, at them, but um, their response was, no, Jesus is Lord. And so they're seen as traitors. Um, and, you know, as I was thinking about that, it just caused me to take a moment um, to, to, to stop and reflect on that. And, and I, I, I want to encourage us to, uh, all of us, as, as we read the scripture, I mean, I know you spend time reading the Bible every day, um, or, or most every day. I'm sure there are days when circumstances prevent that. But, um, you know, part of our normal routine is to have uh, some time, it, it may be a relatively short period of time, but have some time where, where we're just, um, you know, just, just reading the Bible. Um, and, uh, you know, there's all kinds of Bible reading plans, and those are great. Um, but it's not about how much you can read or, um, or how long you spend reading. Uh, it, it's, it's more, I think, I think especially for you know, folks like us who have been around the Bible for a while, um, it, it's more a matter of uh, slowing down and letting the scripture sink in, of, of taking our time to pause and reflect. So um, as I was reading that first part of First Thessalonians, um, it, it just caused me to stop and to think for a moment, oh, wait a minute, these, these people were living in a world where there were many gods. Well, you know, in reality, so are we. Um, I mean, we may not call it, call it the false gods mammon or Mars, or uh, we, we don't have anybody in charge of us named, who calls himself Caesar, um, but we have consumerism. I mean, well, you know, my goodness, um, the stores were all uh, decorated and pushing us to spend money for Christmas uh, before Halloween was over. Um, we, we live in a world where militarism is worshiped. We live in a world where nationalism is worshiped. Those are just different names for the same gods. 
And, and there are a lot of people around us, you know, so, and I'm talking about Christians around us, who, who try to blend those gods with King Jesus. And, and Jesus himself said, you can't do that. Um, it's impossible. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it, it behooves us just to, to, to stop and, and think about what it must have been like. You know, maybe imagine what it must have been like for those Thessalonians back then. Um, and to realize that even though we live in a completely different culture, completely different time, yet we have something in, in common. Um, it, we also are confronted with a world that worships all kinds of other things other than Jesus. Um, and, and, and I don't want to slip into that, you know. I, I want my allegiance to be 100% for Jesus. So Paul goes on then in chapter 2, and he recounts his mission in, um, in uh, Thessalonica. When he was there, he and Silas were there. And, he, and as you read that, those first 12 verses, especially of chapter 2, um, not, notice the intimate metaphors that he uses. He describes himself as being like their mother. And then he also describes himself as being like their father. <laughs> Um, his point is that we're family, you know, and not just in a, um, um, in, in kind of a uh, superficial sense, but in a, in a real sense, we belong to each other and we are responsible for each other. And, and the love that we have for each other as believers in Christ um, should be like the, you know, that in the best of families, you know what I mean? Um, treating all of those, uh, w all of our sisters in the Lord who are uh, older than we are as our mothers and those that are our age or younger as our sisters and the men who are older as our fathers and uh, the others as, you know, brothers. Um, recognizing that we we are family and we're responsible uh, for each other. And it hit me there too, that um, uh, as you look at the life of Paul um, and Silas and, and uh, you know, Mark and, and uh, Barnabas and all, all the others, um, what we see in the New Testament is the, that the essence of leadership is, is not control, or power, or giving directions or orders, it's loving relationships. And all of us are in positions of leadership. Um, uh, you know, we may not think of it that way, but, but all of us have, have areas in our lives where we have some influence. Um, you know, may, maybe it's over uh, nieces and nephews, or grandchildren, or uh, neighbors, or friends, or uh, you know, I mean, there's, there's people in all of our lives that, that we are in relationship with. And, and, and that should never be a relationship of manipulation or power or lording over. But instead, it should always be one of service and loving relationships. Then Paul goes on in the, as he continues in chapter 2. Uh, he talks about their common hardships, his and theirs, the people that he's writing to. Um, he refers to the, um, his friends in Thessalonica and, uh, of course, they're being persecuted by Rome, uh, being accused of being traitors and all. Uh, at the time that Paul's writing this, he's being persecuted by some of his fellow Jews. But in both cases, they are participating with Jesus in his suffering. So what Paul's saying is that these hard times that you're going through where you are, and I'm going through some hard times where I am, uh, it, it's okay, because this is all part of what Jesus is doing in the world. Uh, this is all part of making uh, all things new. Um, as C.S. Lewis said, hardships often prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. Uh, so he reminds them of that. And that's a good thing to be reminded of. 
Um, then the rest of chapter two and moving into chapter three, uh, he describes the tremendous anguish that he's had over uh, their suffering. You know, he, 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 he's had them on his heart, Paul has. And so he, he inquires as to how they're doing. And the message comes back to him that the people in Thessalonica are really being persecuted. They're really suffering. And Paul's in anguish over that. So he sends Timothy to check on them. And then Timothy comes back and, and basically reports, hey, yes, these people are suffering. Yes, they're going through hard times, but they are so full of the power and the love and the joy of, of the Lord. Uh, you, you just wouldn't believe it. And, and when Paul gets that message, he's overjoyed here that they're doing they're, they're, they're doing wonderfully in spite of their hardships. Not, you know, not that he wants them to continue to go through hardships, but he's just so delighted that their faith is growing and that in spite of what's happening, um, God is on the move. And um, in spite of the troubles that they're going through, they're knit together in love. Uh, they're really doing well. So then he brings that first section to a conclusion, and now he links it with the second section. Remember, there's two sections in the book of uh, First Thessalonians. In the first one, he's celebrating the, uh, the work of God in their midst. And in the second section, uh, he is encouraging them to continue to grow in Christ. And he introduces the first section with prayer. Now he links section one and section two with another prayer. And then we'll see that he ends the thing with a third prayer. So this is the second prayer. Uh, and it introduces the themes that he's going to get into in chapters three and four um, and five. Um, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. He really wants to come back and visit them. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he strengthen your hearts in holiness, that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. <coughs> Excuse me. In that prayer, he introduces what he's going to talk about in the next couple of cha chapters. He's praying that, uh, that God would inundate them. Well, he's praying, first of all, that God will open a way for him to come visit. And then he's praying that God will inundate them with love for one another and for everybody. Love for the Romans, love for your enemies, love for everybody. He's saying, I'm, I'm overflowing with love for you you to be overflowing with love for everybody around you. Isn't that a beautiful prayer? And, and, and don't you love the fact that Paul doesn't pray, um, God, I pray you take away all the persecution and, and, uh, and instead put these people in charge of, of, of the government and um, then they can run things, make things right. Um, you know, uh, it, it, that's, that's not what he prays for. He prays for love to be abounding. And may God so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord with all his saints. So he's introducing the blessed hope of the church. The fact that uh, we know that on the cross, uh, evil was defeated, sin was taken off the table, and that Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, was raised from the dead. He's ascended to the right hand of the Father. He's poured out his Holy Spirit on all flesh and continues to do that. He is making all things new. And someday, we're not told when, we don't predict dates, but someday he's going to come again and, uh, and, and finish the work that he's been doing for the last 2,000 years, which is slowly making all things new. He's going to complete that work and redeem the entire cosmos. That's our blessed hope. That's the hope that we hold in our hearts. The, the hope of a world without any war, the hope of a world where justice reigns, where there is no poverty, there is no racism, there's no hatred, there's no violence, there's no killing. 
there aren't any wars and so forth. So we enter now into the second section of the book, the challenge to continue to grow. Uh, that's really what chapters four and five are all about. And when he talks about growth, he's talking about holiness. And he introduces that in the first part of chapter four. And, you know, when you when we talk about holiness, um, I think what often comes to my mind, perhaps it does your mind also, is uh, sexual responsibility. Uh, and, and certainly that is that is important. Um, but holiness is more than that. Um, it's it's it, it, it's it's much broader. It includes uh, all the activity in our lives. Holiness involves uh, treating other people, all other people, with respect, with dignity, with honor, with integrity, and uh, all, doing whatever we can in love to point them towards Jesus. Um, you can see that, I mean, that, that certainly includes being sexually responsible. Uh, if you're treating others with respect and dignity and honor and integrity and pointing them to Jesus, um, that's going to make you responsible, you know, in, the, uh, in sexuality, but it makes you responsible in every area of our relationships with others. Um, never, never using other people or manipulating other people, but always treating others with respect and dignity, Re remembering that every person we see, every in every person, um, this really hit me this morning. I was um, in Chicago and, and uh, uh, there was a, um, um, a man, I think it was a man. I mean, actually um, this individual had um, was so bent over and had so many, um, raggedy clothes on against the cold that it was difficult to tell but um he or she uh, was pushing a shopping cart that was just uh as full as it could possibly get piled up with um with textiles with with, with old um blankets and bedspreads and um and who knows what else i mean and it, it was all uh dirty and he's pushing this heavy load uh, up an incline. Um, and and it, as I sat there at the traffic light watching this individual, it just hit me. That person was created in the image and likeness of God. God loves that individual so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for them. Now that changes your whole perspective of how you look at people, um, whoever they you know, maybe. Um, so Paul is 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 trumpeting forth this this call to holiness, which involves sexual um, responsibility, but it's much bigger than that. In fact, when we talk about sexual energy, um, we mean a, a lot more than just having sex. You know, um, someone uh, uh, who was it, Christine Northrup. I don't know who that was, uh, said sexual energy is the life force, the eros that permeates all of creation as part of the joyfulness of creation. And Janet Ruffing said, eros is, up, is the uplifting ecstatic energy in music. You know, have you, have you ever been just been really moved by music or moved by a work of art or moved in worship? or you've had those intense feelings of love um, for another person or, or maybe for a flower, you know, uh, or, or, or maybe you've had that, that burst of energy in some creative thing that you've done or um, e even in playfulness or in dancing or in communion with nature, you know, all of those things. Uh, that, that's all included when we talk about that, that um, erotic energy, you know, that all of us have. Um, and Paul is saying, take that and point it towards Jesus. Point it towards the dignity of, of others and the good of others. So there's a serious call to holiness, and then there's a serious call to love. 
uh, all of us, of course, are called to love and to serve others. The greatest in the kingdom is the servant of all. And uh, Paul in uh, chapter four uh, says that it's important to, to be diligent, to work diligently, not so you can get rich, uh, but so that you can have uh, enough to be generous with others. And, and I just think that's so beautiful, you know. Um, well, wasn't it uh, John Wesley that said uh, something like, make as much money as you can and give away as much money as you can or something to that effect. Uh, that's the idea, the generosity there. Um, so, I, you know, I was just stopping to let that sink in too. Um, any, anything that degrades or manipulates uh, another person is a misuse of God's gifts. Um, and secondly, we work not to get stuff um, as much as the culture around us wants us to keep buying things and buying more things. Uh, but we work so that we can be generous towards others in need. And then Paul moves into the area of hope towards the uh, end of chapter four, middle of chapter four and the end. Um, and he's addressing some eschatological questions. Eschatology is the study of what's going to happen in the end. Uh, how's this all going to pay out? And apparently in the church of at, uh, Thessalonica, there, some of the people had died. Um, very likely they had been martyred, considering what was going on there. And, and the others in the church there were really concerned about them. They were like, oh, you know, our, our, our brother died. Is, is he going to miss out? Um, on, on this this kingdom that God's building? I mean, is, is he just gone or what's going to happen to him? What's going to happen to her? And Paul's answer is that, first of all, even death cannot separate us from Jesus and his love. Nothing can separate us from Jesus and his love. Uh, not life, not death, not circumstances. Nothing can ever separate us from Jesus and his love. And, and then he goes on to reiterate that when we as believers die, we are with Jesus. And that's a temporary state, not the with Jesus part, but uh, the, the, it's temporary until he comes again. And then the dead will be resurrected. The living will be transformed. And then we'll continue to live with Jesus uh, in brand new resurrection bodies. Um, so Paul's saying, don't worry about your friends that have passed away. Um, God's got them. They're safe. They're with him. They're happy. They're doing well. And when Jesus comes again, you know, whether that's next week or, or you know, um, 10,000 years from now, when Jesus comes again, um, all of our bodies will be resurrected and transformed to live with him in a renewed universe forever. And then uh, we'll spend more time on this in the future, but he gives this beautiful analogy. Um, it, it was common in uh, Roman days that um, um, Caesar would, would uh, he didn't just you know, sit in Rome, um, he would visit the various providences uh, that were out there under his control. And when Caesar was coming to visit a city, there would, that was announced ahead of time, of course. And there'd be this big celebration that's going on in the city. Um, and then as his entourage approached the city, the people of the city, particularly the dignitaries in the city, uh, would, would go out to meet him and then escort him back into the city. Um, and, and they always had a, you know, like a temporary throne set up for him um, and all sorts of banquets and stuff. So they would welcome him into the city. And that's the analogy that Paul uses. He says, when, when Jesus comes again, the believers on earth are going to rise up off the earth to meet him and to welcome him back to earth uh, and to welcome his, uh, the establishment of his throne and the coming of new Jerusalem. And uh, it's just a beautiful picture that we'll talk more about in, in uh, uh, another study. 
Um, so, you know, I, I know we've said this before, but it, it, the gospel isn't just about us going to heaven. Um, it, it does concern me that um, sometimes we have, and I know I've done this uh, a lot in the past, um, we've depicted Christianity as if uh, the world's a mess, uh, you're a mess, um, it, it's, it's all going to be destroyed, um, and the best we can hope for is just to get out of here. So um, accept Jesus, and then when you die, you get to go to heaven. Um, it, you know, that, all of that's somewhat true, um, but that's not what the gospel emphasizes. The, the Bible doesn't emphasize us going to heaven when we die, although, you know, you do go to be with the Lord when you die. Um, that's, that's a for sure. Um, but the emphasis is not about us going to heaven. It's about heaven coming here. It's about heaven filling the entire cosmos. It's about God not just redeeming a few individuals, <coughs> but making all things new, redeeming the entirety of all of creation. And that's the hope that motivates us to faithfulness. And that's what chapter five is all about. Um, like the ancient Roman Empire, all empires proclaim peace and justice, but through war, oppression, threats, state-sanctioned violence. You know, Rome was, was really big on, on these mottos. You know, Rome, Rome is all about peace and Rome is all about justice, the Pax Romana, you know, the, the, the peace of Rome and the justice of Rome. Well, uh, yeah, there was peace, if by peace you mean absence of conflict, um, because everyone had been bludgeoned into submission. Um, that's not real peace. That's, that's, that's just intimidation. Um, the kingdom of, of, of God Jesus' kingdom is, is way different than that. His empire, his kingdom, uh, brings real peace and real justice, but not through war, oppression, or threats, or any of that. It brings peace and justice through love. And what Paul's encouraging us to do, encouraging first the Thessalonians, and then us, you know, um, secondarily, He's encouraging us to live in that reality now, to live by Jesus' rules, to remind ourselves that Jesus is my king. I, I, I'm not a part of any empire other than the, uh, the kingdom of God. My allegiance is to King Jesus. We, we live by the law of love. We live by the law of self-sacrifice. We, we live by the cross. We know that evil has been defeated by our king. We know that our king is making all things new. We happily join him uh, in, in that, in that um, work, making all things new, joining him in that work. And, and we're filled with the blessed hope that one day he's gonna come and complete that work and well, we're gonna be perfect and everything's gonna be perfect around us. Uh, Jesus conquers sin and evil by loving rather than hating, by dying rather than killing, by serving rather than controlling. And we're invited to join him in that. We're invited to act like our king. And then Paul brings the book to a conclusion with a, with a prayer of hope. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, set you apart entirely, make you completely holy. And may your spirit and soul and body, every part of you, be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. Do you see that? He will do it. May, may God keep your spirit and soul blameless. And don't worry about, you know, the fact that you're not perfect yet because God is faithful and he's going to complete that. Beloved, pray for us. Greet all the brothers and sisters with a holy kiss. Um, I solemnly command you by the Lord that this letter be read to all of them. 
uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So this book has um, three main emphases. Uh, and, and it's really tied into the, the season of Advent. It's all about hope. And that hope produces love and holiness. When we live in the hope that our God is making all things new, when we live into that on a daily basis, it fills us with love and it makes us holy, not just in the sense of there's a bunch of, there's a list of things that I don't do, but uh, holy in the sense that I'm proactively treating others with respect and with dignity and, and, and so on. Advent is all about hope that produces love and holiness. So 1 Thessalonians, taken as a whole, 30,000 foot bird's eye view, um, aren't a lot of birds that fly that high, but you know what I mean. Uh, it reminds us that following Jesus is always countercultural. It always goes against the grain. Following Jesus is also always controversial. It always has been, always will be. So how do we respond to the culture? How do we respond to the controversy? Well, with love, with grace, with generosity. Motivated by the hope that God is in the process of making all things new, that Jesus is coming again, that one day righteousness is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, that one day the entire of universe, the whole of the cosmos, is going to be totally transformed and redeemed and saturated with cruciform love. That's our hope. That's the hope that we live in. So I, I would encourage you to, to just, it's a short letter, and I'd encourage you just to, uh, when you have time, um, especially during this busy holiday season, um, that, you know, take, take some time out to just read straight through Thessalonians. For, forget the chapter divisions and the, and the, um, the, verse division, and the, the verse markings and all those weren't there in the original. Just read it straight through like a letter and maybe read it in a, in a version of the Bible that you're not as familiar with. Maybe you'll get some new insights. Um, next week, we're going to drill down on the theme of love. And then two weeks from now, we'll drill down on the theme of holiness in this book. And then three weeks from today, we'll finish up First Thessalonians by really drilling down on hope. And we're going to talk about the second coming. And we're going to talk about um, this uh, doctrine of the rapture. And we're going to uh, all of that stuff. Um, so excited uh, to be a part of that. I um, thought we'd spend a little bit of time if you'd, if you'd like to. I know some of you have to go, and that's okay. Um, there's no pressure, you know, if you want to jump off, it's fine. But if you can stay around and uh, um, uh, add a voice to the conversation, I know it'll be a blessing to others. Um, and uh, just, just some, um, uh, some questions to get us started. Um, given that broader definition of holiness, you know, not just... Uh, um, you know, make, make sure you don't have sex with anybody that you're not married to kind of thing. Uh, but that expanded definition of holiness, that uh, holiness is treating everybody with a sense of integrity and dignity. Um, how can we live more holy lives on a day-by-day -day basis? And then uh, may maybe even uh, um, a stronger point, um, in this Advent season, how, how does the hope of Advent inform your life today? What difference does it make today? And then, and, and when I say the hope of Advent, I mean, um, I, I, I mean both Bethlehem and the Second Coming. <laughs> you know, I, I mean the whole picture, because that's what Advent points towards. Um, so, if you'll permit me, um, I'd, I'd like to pray for us, and then. We'll go into some breakout groups for, you know, maybe 10 minutes or so, and then we can get back together again. Father, we ask in Jesus' name that you would take this um, overview of First Thessalonians and help us to 
uh, having seen its structure and having felt the, the depth of Paul's love for these people, cause us, Lord, to enter more deeply into your love and into your hope and into your uh, call to set the world right uh, by serving and loving others. Oh, Father, may this Advent season be greatly heightened by the blessed hope of your coming in our hearts. And we thank you in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.